time tonight, but I'm glad that um, some of you have made the, the choice to involve yourselves in the community and, and in the elections that are coming up that are important for our local community. So what my role here tonight is, is to try to create a forum that everyone has um, equal opportunity to answer the questions. We have about eight questions for each um, set of candidates. And um, so multiply that times the number of people and so forth. And what I uh, would like to do is to give you a minute to respond to each question, and that should give us enough time to hear everyone and, and get through the questions. Um, but we'll start by having each of you introduce yourselves, tell a little bit about your background, and what makes you interested in running for school board or city council. So, um, you want to start here? Sure. Uh, I think I know almost everybody here. Um, I'm Dakota Tucker. I'm an alumni of St. John High School, 2009. Um, I've lived here all my life. I have an interest in city council because I think that young people are active in school and their community, and then as soon as school's done, they're gone. And uh, I want to find a way to kind of let the young people know that they are welcome and that their voice can be heard in the city. Also, there are some issues in the city that uh, have went on, and, and uh, I wish to keep it fair for all. Um, money shouldn't be an issue. If you have money, if I have money, and my thought is, is um, we're all here to help each other um, make our town the best that it can be through the city that we provide and the service that we provide for the people. And uh, if we have a good city, we'll have a good school. And uh, we'll want people, those people will want to move to our school and our town if we have an efficient city. And uh, I just want to do my part and give back to my community. I'm Marshall Sanders. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of St. John. Um, married to Mandy. We've got four kids. Um, I do own a business here in St. John. I'm running for city council just to help guide the rest of the community and bring everything together and, and hopes to build it up and, and bring a future to St. John for younger kids and, and businesses. Have a place for families to come back so that they can raise their kids like I have with ours. Um, give them a nice place to come, even to retire. Um, you know, we've got lots of problems that the city faces day to day, year to year. Um, and I think by being a part of it, I can help sort some of that stuff out and, and make it a better place for everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Warner. <coughs> I was born in the St. John Hospital when I was in the hospital. I've lived here all my life. Uh, uh, married my high school sweetheart, Sabrina. I have uh, two kids, Bryce, he's 21, and Miranda, she's 16. She's a sophomore here at St. John. Uh, I graduated here. My wife graduated here. Uh, I think my dad, he's in the audience, he graduated here. I think my grandpa graduated here. Uh, I'm just interested in, in helping the school, uh, trying to give back and, and uh, donate my time to, uh, you know, help the kids. I'm Debbie Waddle. I um, graduated from here. I went kindergarten to 12th, you know, to grad to 12th grade, then um, left St. John to go to college and swore I'd never come back. Um, but I did, and because the city has welcomed me so much, and through the years that I was out in other um, areas, especially ones related to education, I wanted to come back and, and serve and give time and give back to the people who've supported me over the years and um, um, showed me that St. John is the right place to raise families and that there's a lot of good going on here. The next few years are going to be challenging with um, finances and there are also uh, issues regarding you know, recruitment and I'd like to think that um, you know, I've got the time and the energy to be able to, to work on those. 
well, gosh, I feel like the odd man out because I'm the only one that's not a native. <laughs> um, my name is Cindy Crockett. I am from Nebraska. Don't hate me for that. Um, my husband, Jason, who's from North Dakota, we settled here about mm, 19 years ago. We've lived in Stafford County, lived out uh, on the farm for about 14 years. Um, we have two kids, Jeremy, who's a junior in high school inside, who's a kindergartner. Um, I have a business, Creative Stitches, where I do embroidery. My husband does um, farm repair work, Crockett Farm, and then um, service, and then we do, we're custom cutters, so we're not here in the summertime. So a lot of you guys, when you guys get together and have all these things, I don't get to, to uh, attend because I'm either out in the field or running for parts. So I guess I'm all new to you guys. Um, I have worked in the school system here in staff in St. John and in Stafford, and I've worked in other school systems. I just think it's important to uh, hear the people. I think it's important to um, know what they want, know what they need. I know that they're like they had said, like Debbie said, the finances is what's really going to be hard. Um, there's cuts that we have no control of through the federal, so then that makes us have to do budget cuts within the school. Um, and I don't want to see us lose our um, the teachers that we have, the curriculum that we have. Um, is there some other way that we can um, bring in more revenue or, or without having to cut things like that? Um, I'm really big in the booster club, um, big in the community, doing the Easter egg hunt. Um, I just, I just, I love people. I love helping people and love volunteering. So, and that's why. You know, I thought maybe uh, my experience on working and uh, being in other school districts and on um, schools, um, I could uh, get some insight and bring it here and be of use of help. Thank you. Um, what I have are questions that have been submitted by um, community members and a, and a few extra that um, kind of try to synthesize some of that. Or so, um, what I'll do is start out with the City Council and ask you, if you were to consider what is most needed to improve the future of St. John, what would be the top two priorities? If you were to consider what is, the most, what is most needed to improve the future of St. John, what would be the top two priorities? We can alternate um, who answers first. If that, that would be I would have to say one of the things to me is we've been dealing with a water issue um, for quite some time now, and it looks like we've started um, to get that issue taken care of. But I still hear a lot of people compliment how, well, compliments and complaints, uh, both sides of it, to where my water's never been better, and then I hear people say, my water's gotten worse. And so, um, would I have approached that issue differently? Probably. Um, some people say, if there was no other way, there's always a way. And um, I, I would see that that's one thing. Um, you know, newborn babies aren't supposed to drink water anyway. But man, I'd really like to have water that you could come right out of the tap and give your baby. Now, that's never going to happen. Um, but that's the thing that I would like to provide, is um, good water to our people. So that's an issue that I can see that's going to continue to face us. I'd have to say that the water issue is one of the big, big priorities in St. John. Um, and I think in time that can be taken care of, but it, it's going to take some, it's going to take time. It, it won't happen overnight. Some of the other things are, is, I do know that it is rather high for some of the fixed income people and, and lower income retirement people to survive in this town and pay bills. Um, you know, and I, I see that that's a problem in the future. You know, if we want to keep St. John going, it needs to be something that's looked at and, and dealt with. Um, the second question that follows that is, do you believe the current city budget reflects the priorities you stated?
I think some of them they do. Um, I know they've started setting money aside to help with some of the, the water issues, and they're working on water issues. Um, I know there's a pretty big project going on right now that they're replacing lines and stuff like that. I think in the future that uh, you know that that money needs to be budgeted for all of the repairs like that, and not you know when it becomes an emergency. You know, I think some planning needs to be done to to help pay for that stuff. I would have to say that I uh, you can go online to the city's website, and uh, they they provided that to the people. Um, their expenditures, their budget, their uh, end of the month balances, that's all provided for the citizens to look at. If you want to know what the city owes on this or the city owes on that, you can go there and you can see what, what the balance is and how they're paying things off. And at one point, um, I didn't understand some of that. And I went in to the city office and asked the clerk, I said, uh, it looks like we're missing about $800,000. Where'd that go? In between, you know, November of 2014 and, and this year, and uh, the citizens put quite a bit of money towards the water issue, and uh, so I think if there would have been some planning a long time ago and budgeting put in effectively to uh, start replacing water lines, start replacing sewer lines, um, we wouldn't have garbage dumping into our ground because that water issue just didn't happen overnight that's been going on for years upon years upon years so uh, you know if uh, effective budgeting uh, money set aside all those years ago um, we wouldn't have had as big a hit as we had so I can see the city putting money um, towards things like that and have some effective budgeting Um, the next uh, couple of questions have to do with the idea of um, knowing the role that, uh, that a city council plays. Um, the question is, have you read the state statutes concerning city councilmen and you know the functions, responsibilities, and authority? Um, and it goes on to ask about awareness, your, what your understanding of city code, Kansas Open Meetings Act, and Open Records Act. Or are you willing to get the proper education <coughs> to perform? Well, when, when I first uh, filed, of course, they give you a little pamphlet and go, thank you for wanting to serve your community. And you go, what? And um, so again, I went right to the city's website. And uh, they do have city code on the website available for you to look at. You don't have to go into the city's office to look at this big book anymore. And uh, there's even a keyword search. So if you want to know something about dog impoundment fees or zoning, or you can search it. And uh, I went in and searched council. And it shows what the roles and expectations are. And it explains a lot of those things. And uh, I'm always willing to learn, and it's a learning experience. Um, when you get in there, you're hit with all this stuff, and if you haven't been in there, um, you know, it's a learning experience for everybody, and I'm willing to uh, definitely put the time in and not just show up every two weeks for an hour and, and oh, I've served my community. I'm willing to put in the time outside to research and try to do the best job that I can do. Along the same lines, he's right with all that. Um, you know, they do have in there exactly the duties of a city council member, along with the mayor and everyone else. Um, I've been through them, and as far as city codes and stuff like that go, uh, I do sit on the city zoning board, so I am aware of a lot of the city codes and city ordinances. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that I know everything there is to know about being a city council member, but I am willing to put forth the effort to fine tune all them details and, and make it better for me and for the city. The next question is, 
what ideas do you have to help bring businesses, jobs, and jobs into St. John, and what role can the city play in stimulating that growth? There's a, having put a business in a couple years ago, there are quite a few regulations and stipulations in the city of St. John to get a business into town. Um, I think they're awful tight. They kind of want to, the city right now kind of wants to control how you do things and how you run a business. And, and I think by loosening that up a little bit, still having some type of guidelines is okay. But putting people out 60, 90, 120 days of trying to get a business started when they're ready to go is probably not the best way to do it. Um, and I think by refiguring that and looking at that a little bit in depth, and making it where it's more feasible for a person to come in and be able to get set up and, and you know, have the city backing them instead of putting their finger on them and telling them how they have to do things and what they have to do, um, I think would bring a lot more businesses to town. I think with uh, business in a small town, we do want to have quality businesses in town. We don't want to just have whatever. But a small business person wants to run their business their way. Um, and yes, there need to be regulations, but like Marshall said, they're a little tight. And uh, you should have the power to run your business as you see fit and not be squeezed dry before you even get a chance to get running. How many businesses have we had in town that have come in and then because they can't afford, you know, all the setbacks and oh you got to have this and jump through this hoop but that's another issue that's facing our town is uh, jobs housing and jobs which one comes first you have to have both for people and uh, if, you, if you can't get anyone to come in and start a business because they have to jump through all these hoops and spend a bunch of money um, how do you have jobs for people like me to come back so we need to do something Um, you mentioned housing. Um, some cities have involved themselves in housing um, development. Do you see a role for St. John in that? I do. I wish some big corporation would come in and build one of those apartment units, low-income apartment units, that has however many apartments in it. Uh, you see larger cities that have these types of places where, you know, 20 people can pull in and live. And uh, as I'm looking out, I saw a lot of people kind of, what are you talking about? You know, we're not big town America. But a lot of people around here don't have the type of money to provide that for people. Um, but I, I feel that, uh, you know, economic development has done their project over at Maxville and they're working with the cities to uh, provide those types of things and I think that uh, the city needs to be working on um, putting housing in or trying to find someone who wants to do that so that people can be here. You don't have a house, you can't live here and we want people here. We've had a uh, population declining and that's like most small towns. But, uh, well, there's a crummy looking house over here. We could probably put some money in that and fix it up for somebody. Ah, uh, let's tear it down. And then you have an empty lot that somebody buys and it sits there. So we need some affordable housing. And I think the city is a perfect candidate for that. So we can help stimulate more our economy and our population. I know that uh, I've attended council meeting since I filed for election uh, for city council. Um, I do know that the city has formed a land bank and they have, they do have a house that they already own, that they are, they do have it on the market for, you know, a, a family to come in and be able to put some money towards it. And I do know that they are looking at purchasing land in St. John for stuff like that. Um, to try and get younger people in here, smaller families, give them something that they can afford to put a little money in 
but it's not a $160,000 house that they can't even think of starting at. Um, so I know that the city has started on the right foot of, of looking at that and trying to bring in younger families, get some more people into this town, and I think you know, that's the future, and I think that's what they're looking to try and do. Um, a couple of the questions submitted had to do with the idea of involving people in um, public forums and um, keeping the community involved. That's always a tough subject. I mean, it, you know, we look at even just tonight and the people that, that are here um, are a small portion of our population. And yet people, I think, hung, I think reflecting I mean, from these questions, hunger for more involvement. How do you think we should address that? How is the best way to? People want to be informed and uh, I do. I know that others do, and uh, as far as being involved, city council meetings two times a month, and uh, the turnout for those meetings, unless it's some big issue that's been going on forever, nobody wants to, I have felt at times that nobody wanted to attend until there was a big issue at hand, and I feel that uh, people do need to be more involved and more informed and have the right story. Um, you know, the story of this person tells this person a story, and this person tells this person a story, and this person tells this person a story. Then the last person on the line tells the first person, they're going, what are you talking about, dude? That's not what I said. And so um, I think people, for one, um, I've heard people complain that the city holds meetings in the city office, and you're packed in like sardines. And I experienced that at one point. And uh, I would go as far to say there was a plan to move city council meetings to the county annex building. And uh, not just for big issues, but for the chance to let people know that, hey, we've got room for you. Come listen. Come state your opinions. You don't have to sign a piece of paper to come talk. Come talk to us. We want to hear it. And uh, I definitely want people to be more involved and more informed. It's just the people have to be willing to come. Along the same lines, he's right. I mean, it is, you are packed in there real tight if there's a lot going on or one, if there's a lot of people in there for a big issue. Um, and I think you're right, probably by opening it up to a bigger area to allow more seating and, and more room. Whether they come or not, I mean, that's more on the citizens. Um, you know, I think, I think they do a pretty good job of recording every single one of them. You know, it is on YouTube and on, I think, uh, the news channel there, the local one. Uh, but I think, you know, it, it does take the community to come out and want to listen and, and be involved in part of it and know what's going on. If, if nothing else, be asking questions about it. The final question here um, has to do with sidewalks in St. John. And as you may know, we have um, a Healthy Communities Initiative designation um, here in Stafford County, and a group of citizens have um, mapped out a path of desired um, improvements in um, the walkability of the town. The question here was, um, what are your opinions on improving the sidewalks in St. John? 100%. Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about not being able to walk to the dollar store. Um, that's a nice long walk, probably farther than I would want to walk, uh, to be honest. But it's not there. And um, a lot of people's sidewalks are in bad shape. And people that are low, in, low income, fixed income, can't afford to replace those sidewalks. And uh, you know, the city put in a nice downtown area uh, all that cement, and uh, did we necessarily need all that? Was, was there money there for that, of course? Um, we stolen a little bit of that money maybe from that and uh, used that to put one sidewalk down this street or one sidewalk down that street while still providing a nice sidewalk around the businesses uptown. And, um, definitely we need to work on uh, some grants, whatever type of funding we can work out 
to be able to provide nicer sidewalks so people can get out and uh, not be in fear of getting run over by a tractor that's moving down the street. So I ran into that problem down West Street where I live. Uh, not a sidewalk down that street. So people who like to walk the outline of town uh, kind of try to stay away from that street as much as possible or try to walk in the grass because you've got spray rigs and tractors and semis you know, coming through town, moving pretty quickly. And uh, you know, so sidewalks are definitely an issue that, that I could see if the money's there or available, we need to work on that. I think the sidewalk bill would be a good deal. Um, it might be one of the things that if, if they can't find the funding, it may be something that takes a couple of years, you know, that the city would have to budget for and, and outline for the future. But, you know, theoretically, I mean, it can be done. It, it doesn't have to be done overnight, but it is something that could be started on and, and finished up with three to four years. That concludes all the questions that have um, been submitted by citizens in advance. If there are any from the floor, we'd entertain that. Do you feel that the city ordinances are adequately enforced in this time? There are city ordinances that are on the books, and I've looked at a lot of them. And, um, no, uh, there's a lot of ordinances that, and I've felt for a long time that if, if we're not going to enforce them, then why are they there? Um, I know it might be kind of a pain for one person to have to enforce all of them, but even when the, the uh, ordinances are brought up and, and someone's in the wrong, they're still not enforced because we don't have time or we don't want to do it. Um, there's a lot of a lot of ordinances and stuff that have been put in place but never been. No one's ever followed through with with the ordinance. I, you know, so I don't feel that they have been taken care of properly. And that was something I'd said a long time ago. If we're not going to do it, then why do we have it there? Because then it gives people something to complain about. You know, whether they do it for this person and then they don't enforce it for this person, it's not right to even have it on the books if you're not going to fall through 100%. Fairness, I would say, would be a big issue. Um, <clears throat> this person over here, this person over here, same thing. This person gets their hand slapped, this person doesn't. I would say that it's easy to write an ordinance and go, oh, there it is. You don't like it tough. Or, the other side of that, well, so and so did this, and I did this, and uh, why'd he why'd he get away, and I'm getting punished? Is his name better than mine? Those type of those type of things, and I would say um, that some things I, I would say that they are enforcing a little bit, um, but if you, like Marshall said, if you're going to write it, let's enforce it. If you're not, why even waste the paper? To write it if you're not gonna not gonna follow the books. Any other questions? This is the community's time to be involved. I'm sorry. This is the time for the community to be involved and ask the candidates and become informed. So I welcome anything. One of the ordinances several years ago was to get rid of all these old junker cars in your yard, in your backyard. They didn't run, you didn't have insurance on them. Um, then do something about it. And that's a lot of the ordinances that half of them were dealt with and the other half were just pushed away. But those things make the city very, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. you don't want to drive through the city and see all that. The beautification side of it, and and also the safety side of it, you know, um, people, you know, kids, kids are going to get into anything, and uh, it'd be a bad deal for a kid to lose a leg because they were crawling around a bunch of old junk and got a bad infection or something to that effect. So beautification is a is a big issue where um, I think some of it has been, oh, put up a fence, and so it's not there. 
So I would say that would be an issue that needs to be worked on. Um, <laughs> My dog just uh, got hit the other night, and so uh, I think they've been actively trying to trap skunks. Uh, the city has, I think, three traps, and they're all loaned out all the time, and someone calls and says, hey, there's a skunk in my yard. Okay, we can come shoot it. It's gonna lay there a couple days, you know, or, uh, so definitely uh, animal control type thing. And the housing, the lapidated housing. Yes, uh, when it's past the point of return, it, it does need to go. If, if there's a chance to save it, I'm all for that. But if it's gone, it's gone. And it also can create that safety issue as well, and the beautification, it hits all of it. And so I would say that those are the things that come up every day and, you know, clock in at 7, clock out at 7.30, we need to look at those issues. Um, Tom and I own a commercial <coughs> facility that houses several, you know, businesses under one roof. And one of my concerns are I know there's probably not a lot you can do about it, but one thing that hinders new businesses coming to town, um, not only just the, the things that you were discussing, Marshall, but the utility bills for the commercial properties is just, it's, it's a shell shock or something when you get that bill in the mail. And if we didn't have several people underneath one roof, you know, and that was kind of our vision, for that commercial property is that several people can have businesses and that we could share the utilities and offer entrepreneurs that were coming to town underneath one roof. But I'll be honest, sometimes that building is not penciled for Tom and I, and part of the reason is the, the high utilities. And I don't know if you can comment in on that, but. Utilities are, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, my utilities are extremely high at my place and all I have is the city utilities. I have no natural gas, um, you know, but it is a it is an issue. And I mean, it's not just an issue for the commercial people. I mean, it is an issue for families. Yes. Um, but our city is typically funded off of electricity. And until a person, and probably someone smarter than me, figures out a way to make it to where not everything relies on electricity to pay the bills, then a person can get a break. You know, I, I do know that the water treatment facility plant, that increased everybody's water bill too. You know, I mean, we pay more for that. Um, I don't know about the utilities. I don't know a solution for that. You know. And I know Davis has come up with some different ideas with their building too, by, you know, at one time you had the um, housing up of our that. People staying the apartments up there, and then having the flower shop, and more having the business, and you know just that concept of how can we use some of those properties right. around the square too to utilize more than one business to share utilities too. I just brought that up because it is so cost prohibitive for people to come to town to renovate something to have that utility, you know, shell shopper plus you know all the startup fees and all that. Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it's something that I, I really would like to look into. And like I said, it may take someone smarter than me because I don't know exactly how everything is 100% budgeted for the city, but I do know that typically the city is funded by the electricity that they We're talking a new business, maybe just get started with that. There's initial first quarter. I, I don't know if there could be some ways to look at, you know, because I know that we've had. I feel as far as utilities go, you do have an electric department person here sitting in the front row. I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, I've heard, you know, I, I've even complained at times about um, the rates. And uh, these guys over here will tell you, um, you know, w one thing, the benefit, you know, I don't know if. Uh, there's much room to maybe bring those rates down. 
um, or go in a, in a, in a type of month-to-month -month basis on rates as far as what's it costing the city for that power, how much of that power is being consumed. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I know we need we need to have something said, but uh, these guys, um, since they kind of restructured the electric department, I've seen them out replacing poles. Yes. I've seen them run a line. Um, they're trying to upgrade their department. So, man, at uh, ice storm or tornado that comes through that rips out all the utilities, you know, or, or shuts us down, stuff coming in, those guys can go flip a switch. We're back online. Well, not flip a switch, but you get my point. It's they're, not so much reducing the electric rates, but, but thinking of small well, businesses doing, starting out. Doing doing some, <laughs> yeah, an incentive package. Just start a business. And, well, even the city working on something like that or, or uh, saying, hey, you know, for your, you know, do it for everybody. How do you feel about the lack of, uh, of a chamber of commerce? Not that we have that many businesses to include under a chamber, but if we have businesses that are looking, where do they go? Yeah, I mean, who, I, mean I know point, that economic development provides some of those resources, but who really holds their hand to help them get started? And at one point there was a well, the Main Street, Main Street which was, you know, it was something. Um, but yeah, that would be definitely something that could be worked on. One more question in the interest of, and, and we'll try to adhere to the one minute yeah. um, answer yeah. to keep it moving. Hey, this this is online utilities and stuff, and I just need quick answers for you. One thing that the city council can do that's very easy to do that's a big stopper for businesses and people moving into town is our current deposit amount is ridiculous. I went to the city a long time ago and talked to them about it because they were actually trying to charge me a higher deposit than was legally allowed by law. And instead of them, I reasoned with them and tried to say, hey, you know, if you have it lower, if you're They went the other way instead of going lower, they went to the maximum allowed by law. And there are some places in St. John, if you want to move into St. John and rent a four bedroom house and you didn't have credit from your other place because you were denied twice, you could pay an $800 deposit to move to St. John for electricity. What would motivate anybody to come to? That's something that's entirely under the city council's control. Would you two be willing to address that, bring that up, and try to change that back to something that's a little bit more in line with? areas around here yeah I mean that's absolutely I mean that's ridiculous if, if someone told me that I had to pay $800 up front as a deposit I'd probably say well I'm going somewhere else and that's exactly what happens I mean you can't take somebody that's got four kids a family and, and try to buy a house in St. John and pay that right up front just off the get-go so yeah I mean that would be something to look at yep when I was when I was uh, moving, when I came back from school, uh, I lived in uh, my grandma's apartments, and I paid the utility bills. But as landlord, um, it was all in her name, of course, and so I was writing the check every month. And when I decided to buy a house and move into my house, I said, "Well, I need my utilities transferred." <coughs> no, you're going to need a deposit, or you're going to need a, a letter of guarantee. And I said, "Excuse me." That made me feel this big in my hometown, living here forever, and paying utilities for well over a year, on time, on the 1st, not the 15th, on the 1st. And to see uh, them want that much money out of me, I said, this is right. Because the press council, their attitude was... I was put in that situation. want those kind of people to be here. If they can't, if they don't have a credit, a letter of credit from their own utility, we don't want those kind of people moving to the left. I didn't have to let it occur. Okay. Okay, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, um, to, in the interest of, of equally hearing for um, the school board, I think we'll move on to um, that set of questions. Um, and we'll start with something that, that speaks similarly to the, the spirit of the overall priorities. So, um, if you were to consider um, what is under the local control of our, or within the control and ability of our local school board to determine, um, knowing that there are a lot of things that influence education that are um, 
influenced by state policy, but there are some things that, that we do have control over at the local level. Looking at what is within the control or ability of the local school board, what do you consider the um, top two priorities to improve the future of the St. John School District? Um, <clears throat> two top priorities. <coughs> You've got to, you've got to be supporting, supportive of your teachers. You've got to find ways for them to be able to teach the kids with all, you know, the budgets and the things that they're they're uh, lacking of. I mean, with, with, it's not their control, the state control, you know, federal control. How can we help them give our kids? A good education. How can we um, leave it to you know um, the curriculum, the scholastics? Um, to me, that's I you know we're losing four good teachers this year. You know um, that's sad to me because I'm from I'm the old school. Um, they didn't like the old school. Um, it's going to be a challenge to find you know, for more teachers to come in, um, give them the tools that they need. Uh, are they a fit for the students? Are they a fit for the, you know, for us? <coughs> Hopefully they will be. Um, I just want to see us get back to teaching the kids, you know, give them what they need so when they're, when they go out, when they graduate from St. John, they're prepared. We have prepared them for the future. And I just, it's gonna, it's harder and harder like I said, because we're, we're, everything that we need is being taken away from us, and it's not our fault, you know. So we have to. I don't want to have to say, okay, guys, you know, now we're gonna we're gonna raise book fees and we're gonna raise taxes and this and that, you know. <coughs> and that's something that we don't need either. So how are we gonna do that? It's, it's something that I, you know, I'm looking forward to. But I would look forward to um, working with the board and finding solutions like that. How can we do that without cutting, you know, lowering our standards or or you got to do without, you know, I don't want to cut anything, you know, as far as what we do that apparently. Uh, I think the top two priorities, the first one is, is funding, of course, with our limited amount of funding we have in the school is really limited on what they can do with funding. I mean, there's, there's really no other ways to, to raise funding, uh, you know, other than increasing fees and that, that little amount is, is, is just minute. Uh, the other thing is replacing our our uh, our, our good faculty that is retiring. I mean, over the next, I think over the next five to seven years, your school district, as far as personnel, is going to look totally different, and and that's going to be a challenge. Uh, I know that uh, some of our administrators have been through uh, some uh, job. Uh, Roundups or job cooperatives, and, and it's tough to find teachers that want to come. We're considered Western Kansas; they, they don't want to come in, and it, it's going to be tough. I think um, for me, the two I see are pretty similar to what they said: recruitment, retention, and recognition of the teachers that we do have. Once we get them here, we need to appreciate them and keep them here. The other thing is with the funding, we need to see that the board is as transparent as possible to um, communicate with the, the not only the, the parents of the kids who are there, but the rest of the community about what the needs are and where the finances are going. So if we do have to look at um, asking for more money, um, that they understand why and how we're spending the money um, that's allocated. Especially this next two years, too, I think it's important to keep on top of the funding as the legislature goes through. So they come up with whatever the plan is at the end of this two-year block grant. So we might be fine for two years, but we have to start preparing for years three, four, and beyond. And we need support to do that. We had some questions submitted related to um, handbook-related policy. So as a policy-making body, the school board annually reviews the student handbook. 
This includes standards on the use of electronic devices, dress, and absenteeism. So the first part of this question, do you believe the current policy is adequate? We'll ask, actually, maybe this in two, in two parts. We'll start with that. Do you believe the current policy is adequate? I think the current policy is adequate, yeah. I, I agree. Okay. And how should school board members ensure that the policy is properly enforced without inappropriately involving, involving themselves in specific cases? I want to go back to that because, um, like I said, I volunteer a lot at the school. I'm in the school a lot. I see what goes on. I've worked within the school. I, I'm in the high school as well as a grade school. Um, and there's a few things that's like that the city's dealing with. If there's a policy in the book, and if you're not going to follow it, what's the point of having it in there? Okay? Um, and so when you see things go on, and it, it's hard, I mean, teachers are supposed to be in the classrooms teaching, you know, and, you know, the principals have their job, the superintendent, you know, so they can't be everywhere at, at all times, you know, and, you know, if you're going to go look for trouble, yeah, you are going to find it, you know, and I'm not saying, suggesting that you, that be done, but, um, when it, like I said, if there's a policy, and I'll come right out and say it, it's the cell phone, you know, um, cell phones are wonderful, you know, they, I know there, there's some classes that use them. Great. But when I'm up there and I see kids walking down the hall during school time, I just don't, you know, gosh, uh, I don't think that that's right. And, and um, you know, there's been a, I'm going to probably hang myself here, but, you know, there was an incident where, you know, could have been a serious thing. Would have never happened had they not been allowed cell phones allowed in their pockets. You know, bring them to school. You got to open lunch. You know, leave them in your vehicle. You know, if mom and dad really needs to get a hold of you, they know how. I didn't have a cell phone. You know, and it was way you know way after smoke signals too. So you know, they knew how to get a hold of me. It's just. It's taken away from what they're supposed to be there for, you know. And so, um, I think for the most part, it's it, it you know it is enforced, you know, when it's when it's seen. But then there are times I don't I don't I think there needs to be more enforcement, you know. And if you just say, hey, don't even bring it in the school; it's in your vehicle. We don't have to worry about it. I think consistency. Um, in enforcement can be um, something that needs to be addressed, but along that line, I think we need to give the teachers and the, the support staff um, training on how they're to be addressed so that they're getting handled consistently. So maybe one teacher, well, you know, we do use it and we're talking about social socialization or, or certain things that you can access if you've got your cell phone there, but other ones are like, nope, it's not going to happen. We need to be consistent with how the teachers are enforcing it, not just and how they address it, not just that we enforce it consistently or say that it's there. Could you repeat the question? Sure. <laughs> um, how should school board members ensure that the policy, referring to the handbook, is properly enforced without inappropriately involving themselves in specific cases? I think they're just going to have to rely on their good administration that they put confidence in to uh, inform inform the board members when they need to be informed. I, I mean, it's not the job of the board member to go to go ask a parent what what went on. You need to go talk to your administration to find out what's going on. So we just need to trust them. Um, the next question, what do you see as the primary responsibility of the school board and, as of you, and of you as a potential school board member? We're there to, we're policy makers, we're there to, you know, uh, support the administration. We're not your teachers, we're not the teacher's boss, we're not the administration's boss, 
we don't, you know, I mean, so many times people think, well, gosh, so-and-so is on the school board, and now I can get so-and-so fired. That's not what we're there for. We're there to set policies. We're there to set, you know, budgets, um, or to help, you know, the superintendent and things like that. I mean, I, I don't, like Mr. Garner said, I don't, we need to, you know, we, we hire them. Let's trust them. Let's have faith in them that they can do, you know, what they are hired for, and then be there if they need us and they need help, then come to us. But you know, I think we have a great administration now. I think we have a great school board now too. Not only the the administration. Um, I think, though, and from what I how I view it is, I think we are stewards um, that we're put here to that the school board is uh, selected to maintain the integrity of our schools and that we keep the kids first and foremost. There could be so many other things that come up in a school board meeting about budgets or, or retention or um, the buses. That was something that was discussed when I was there. But the bottom line is, are we, are we remembering what's in the best interest of the kids? Uh, and if we don't have that as the basis of everything that we do and look at everything through that context, then, then um, we're not doing our jobs. We need to be good stewards for the kids. I, I would agree with what the uh, lady said to say. As far as I know, uh, policy is the number one thing and, uh, and funding. Uh, Mr. Meyer has a small little chair in the boardroom and uh, we, we try to make sure that that's what we're there for, is that little chair to, to do what's best for the kids. One other question that I may not, um, you may have already answered it in some ways, but it's a well-phrased question, so I'm going to go ahead and pose it. Um, what areas or functions of the school district do you feel are most in need of improvement at this time? Uh, that's a really good question. When you're talking about functions of the school district I, that are that are needed in, in the most need of improvement, I I think it would go to uh, a whole. The whole school needs to continually try to improve. I don't think there's really one thing that 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 we need to to do. I mean. Uh, I think it's all one thing. That's that's a that's a pretty interesting question. I agree. I don't see that there's any glaring omissions or things that seem to be out of whack with the school. Um, you know, I was discussing with a couple people this past week about how St. John is getting the reputation for athletics, and um, some people brought to my attention that maybe we need to be known for more than that. But I look back at the newspaper and I look back at the recognitions at the games, our kids are getting recognized for other things. And we are, you know, having arts. We do have um, grade school programs. Maybe they aren't as well attended as the, the gym for, <laughs> for the basketball teams, but there's still a lot of support for that. So I, I don't think that there's anything that the school's necessarily missing. We can just continue to refine it, retune it, and make it better. Yeah, I just, I can't think I can I can't really add anything to that, you know. I mean, you uh, always try to do better. I mean, nobody you if keep going till we till we're perfect, and we know we're never going to be perfect, but keep going towards that way, and you know, keep the kids in mind. It's it's for them. I would like to add something. I'm currently on the, the library board, and I would like to see us use the library. Not, uh, I think it's a beautiful facility and it's just underused and we can incorporate that more through the school and, and through the community. So. Did you smile at that one, Mark? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, at this time, if there's any questions from the floor, you're welcome. Insert <laughs> one. Um, as far as you guys were talking about policy and cell phone and things, um, when I was in high school, I had several encounters where I uh, corrected 
the administration and their policy because they told me that I couldn't have it. And I told them, yes, I can. I have freedom of speech and uh, telecommunications falls into that. And as long as I'm not using it, I have the security of it with me. And with so many things going on in our country, I guess my question were to say, one, um, having those mobile devices is a form of security for the students because you see videos and proof of these things happening in our schools. You have, um, when kids are being bullied, videos. You have the, that side of the tool. Um, yes, there's a lot, most of the problems, Facebook and things like that. I've even heard people say things about teachers spending too much time on Facebook. But as far as the question goes, um, with cell phones, um, they, do you see them as a benefit or a nuisance? Because in college, I saw kids operating in classes off just cell phones um, instead of laptop computers. So that's kind of a moving towards the future thing, modernize, modernizing and, and um, innovating and adapting to technology. So when you guys say, keep them out, I think they need to be going in. What are, what are your thoughts? Um, <clears throat> if they're used in the right way, yes. But you know, I graduated with honors in my class and I never had a cell phone. So that's what I'm saying. If you you can um, use them in the right way, and I, yeah, I agree. You know, a lot of the, some of the classes they use them for social media and stuff like that. You're going to have those who don't use them, like you know, for that. Um, but how many apples does it take to ruin the whole barrel? Just one, you know. Um, you talk about uh, you see it, you know. If it, the kid wouldn't have the cell phone, he wouldn't be able to call, and you know. Well, if the kid wouldn't have the cell phone, he wouldn't have started this riot, you know, or things like that. So there's 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 pros and cons, you know. Um, is I don't really know the answer, you know, totally. It's just something that I would think as a you know as a whole we should you know it should be talked about or discussed. But um, you know I don't know you know kids are going to abuse things. Um, they're kids, you know. So how do you regulate that? I don't know. You know. That's an area where the regulations change from day to day. The the use of social media changes from day to day, whether it's the cell phones, Facebook, I mean the the pad iPads, the um, computer access, even in the library. That that's just a, one of those things that we continually have to look at, refine, redefine. Um, and make better. But if you know that it's being abused or not used for appropriate times, or you see kids texting while they're in in class, they don't need to text when they're doing um, geometry. So it doesn't need to be in a geometry class. Maybe they've got it there, like you said, for security. But if the teacher knows that it's out there and it's not needed for that class, then it should be put away. Uh, I don't think that cell phones are going anywhere. They're not going to go away. Uh, laptops aren't going away. iPads aren't going away. So I think that it's the school's responsibility to try to train the kids at a young age on how to use their phones properly uh, and, and not, not use them as a, as a negative tool or, or an ineffective tool, but to teach them how to use them the right way, when to use them the right way, and and just go on. We need to embrace them because they're not going anywhere. Trying to keep them out is not going to work. that was involved when the library opened. I remember being part of the chain, the book chain, bringing it over from 
you know, the school library and the town library. Um, so to me, the library should be the heart of the, of the city. I, I like the idea of, of kids coming over here um, during their study hall or coming over as a class to research something, to have um, programs in this room or um, making it as just part of the school on a regular basis. It's just one more area that we build into our curriculum. Um, and as far as being part of the community, well, we're working on that right now, getting more people in here. Um, I even wrote to, what's it called, the Reading Rainbow or whatever it is that Sue Peters does, and asked them if they would come out and consider doing the library, you know, reading with the kids here in the library. And I also asked if they would consider coming out and doing one of the storm chaser things here, um, trying to get more people from town into the library. So that's just a couple things that I've, that I've thought of since I've been here. I, I think it's a tough situation that we're in because technology has made it to where, I don't want to sound negative, but printed material is, is going by the wayside. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know whether uh, we need to do what Debbie said and try to incorporate it more because we know that that uh, technology has is, is kind of put it on the back burner. And, and you know, that might be our, uh, the school's responsibility to try to get that. Make it where there's more programs here for the kids to do. Uh, make it where, when I was in school, we came over all the time and looked up stuff. But, Technology's taken that away. Where, where I don't, I don't even know if the kids come here once a day or not. The the grade school used to come once a day. I don't know if they still do, but uh, uh, and maybe the school needs to work on that a little bit. Uh, community wise, I don't know. Just uh, I, I would agree with what Debbie said. Just trying to do whatever we can to uh, to make this. I think this community room is is underutilized a little bit. Uh, you know, as far as things that, that could be here that aren't. Uh, I guess that's all I have to say. I couldn't say better. If there aren't any other questions, I think that concludes. Thank you, everyone.